This okay. conference will now be recorded. Okay, we're good to go. All right, this is the regular meeting of the Darien Parks and Recreation Commission, Wednesday, August 19th, being held virtually via the GoToMeeting platform. First order of business is to approve the minutes of July 15th. Uh, they were sent out in the packet, and then we realized that not all the pages were there, but they did go out this afternoon with all the pages attached. So does anybody have any um, proposed changes to the minutes? No? Everybody was good as is. Well, remarkably, I had no changes. That might be a first for me, like ever. Um, so if that's fine, then we can uh, take a motion to approve the minutes. Can I have a motion from someone? I make a motion to Okay. Thank you, Kathy. A second. It's Mike, I second. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so Pam, this is where you'll need to roll call. Okay, Susan Daly. Uh, yay. Uh, Mary Louise. Here. Lucy. Here. And that would be it. That's a yes, okay. Um, yes. Don't I have, okay. I don't have to vote, okay. I think I vote. Do you vote? I think so. Okay, Lori. Yes. Yep, they're okay, fine. Okay. okay, what about Tier? Tier's not on, is she? Oh, is Tier. She I'm here. Is that a yes? Approve the minutes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we got Lori, Tier, Mike, Susan, Kathy, Mary Louise, and Lucy all voted. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, so next we'll go to the main uh, topic for, for this evening, and that is to um, receive and talk about a presentation that um, has come regarding the concessions at our, um, our beaches and also at Maguan. Uh, just to provide a little bit of background before I turn it over to Pam and then our guests. Mary, um, one second. Do yes. we want to hit public comment just to get that out of the way? Do we have Meaning, to do anything other than append them to the minutes? I thought we had to at least um, acknowledge who they came in from. No? Okay. Okay. If you want to do that, so then. We received, we received three email public comments that will be attached to the minutes and posted to the website. Uh, one by Cheryl Russell, another by Karen Bosak, and the other by Jen Moeller. Okay, thank you for correcting me on that. Okay. And Pam, we also received a, uh, a note from uh, Bob Lyons this afternoon as well, which I, I think was kind of intended as public comment since there are questions in that. I pulled that along I to you, you guys. I didn't see that. And they were supposed to be in by 12 noon. I didn't see his email and it would have had to say it was po it was meant for public comment for this meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that being said, Mike, I did see it. It seemed like there were a number of questions regarding the presentation we're about to receive. Correct. So yeah. I think those, those items will get touched off as we proceed. Thanks, Lord. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so back uh, regarding the presentation, uh, as the commission members know, the two concessions at Weed Beach and Pear Tree have been operating under a multi-year contract with the current provider. Uh, Pam, I'm not even sure how far that goes back. Um, I think it certainly predates my time on the commission. So I think it's it's many, many 20, years. 20 years. 20 years. Okay, thank you. Um, and the term of the lease is generally three years. And this, um, this summer season is the last year of the current lease. Uh, unfortunately, the um, current provider was not able to open uh, either location this summer, uh, nothing to do with the 
COVID pandemic or challenges with that, just something completely personal in nature that he was not able to do that. So uh, the concessions have been closed this summer. As we move forward and think about, you know, establishing a contract for the spaces on a go forward basis uh, with this long term arrangement, it did seem to make sense that we really revisit what we're doing down there and understand better what our options are. The current vendor owns quite a bit of the equipment that is on site in both of the facilities. So one of the challenges of putting putting this out to competitive bid is that other providers, if they needed to put in their own equipment, could be considered cost prohibitive. That's one of the challenges that we've had and that Pam's had over the years trying to get other other bidders versus the incumbent who's already got the equipment there, which is presumably fully fully depreciated. So we wanted to really take this opportunity to learn more about um, sort of the, the business, so to speak, of, of running concessions and really understand what types of things the commission should be thinking about as we look at this over the coming months um, and preparing for future for future seasons. Uh, we had put in this year's budget request money to purchase equipment at Weed Beach. Um, there was some support from that from the selectmen and others, but then as the budgets re got, were revisited uh, due to the challenges from the pandemic and the concern to be very, very tight on the budget that was, uh, that was removed from this year, although there was some discussion that if we had a proposal during the year, we should come back but they did leave in the budget money to allow us to hire an outside consultant with experience in the concession business to help really ed educate us on the different ways that concessions can be run, what works, what doesn't work. Um, also to view our facilities and provide some um, observations about our facilities, you know, what, what they're like now, what, you know, the issues with them may be now and what the potential is based on what they saw. So based on that, um, we did go out and it, we were able to have um, the study done. At the same time, we also got the survey out to give us some information from, you know, from the community in terms of what they're looking for. Hold on, I'm just scrolling back. And also, you know, any observations about, you know, experiences of the current the current provider to give us some feedback and uh, you all provide the link to the survey results so with that I will turn it over to Pam who will introduce and talk a little bit more about what she asked um, this firm which is named profitable food facilities worldwide to do for us and then we'll turn it over to them to discuss the report that they that they presented to us great so we had conversations, Mike and I, um, about um, our facilities. Um, he needed to know basic information um, about, you know, locations, how many. Um, they asked us about the attendance at each beach, if we could kind of rally that inf information up, um, uh, revenue, uh, menus and prices, hours of operation. Um, there was a list of things that he had provided. And I did reach out to Jim Coughlin, who has been, uh, he's our assistant director, who has been heavily involved in the concession background for the last 20 years. He's been here as well. Um, Mike, I also gave Mike uh, Holtzman, the president of Profitable Food Services uh, Worldwide, uh, Rob's um, uncle, it's Dully's Rob, who's been doing our concession stands, uh, gave him his information to be able to reach out to him as well, to get a little bit of information. Um, oh, I asked for Tierre and Lori your feedback as well as Jim's feedback on the um, survey as well as Mike and his team about you know what types of things we would be looking for to get responses from just based on the last couple years of uh, residents feedback our commissions feedback is this something we do do residents um, do they want a concession stand are they looking for a larger menu? Are they looking for healthier food? Are they looking for nothing at all? Are they looking for changes? Um, so all those types of things were kind of teased out. We came up with, I believe it was 19 questions 
And we were able to time that really well since Mike was coming in on July 17th or so. And we were able to get that survey done out to the public. And we helped, we had that out there for a, a real good two to three weeks. And so I, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number right now. It's difficult to get back into the survey monkey to get the, I left it on too long without closing it out and they kept adding more numbers, but I want to say it was 970 respondents. And with, I would say, geez, 80% of it came within the first week. And then there were dribs and drabs that added up to that 970. So great information for Mike's team. And, um, you know, outside of the questionnaire that they had sent me and I shared with Jim and Lori and Tier, um, I, I think they got a good feeling for what we were looking for in terms of our operation and our facilities. And we also added in Little League at McGuan because it is our operation. It is our facility. It's just that it's been run by Little League. And it's been, it's, it was my understanding while Sean Ryan, who's the president of Little League reached out to me and he really has no interest in running the concession. It's been more of a bother and troublesome than it's been worth for him because he's he too has to find a vendor and if it's not a vendor that he can he can rely on and it just hasn't been worth the time. So we added that in because it is a town facility and Mike was able to also go there and observe and analyze their operations and look at it as one whole. Could this be something that the town does in-house or not? And what would the results be? So I'm going to hand it over to Mike. He's the president of Profitable Food Services Worldwide. And I met him at the NRPA convention. Um, and he has been um, an expert in this field for many years. <coughs> All yours, Thank Mike. you so much. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks, everybody. Wow, this is kind of cool. I get to see pictures and everybody here and, and what a great, 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 brave new world we're working in. So um, I appreciate all your time and for, for taking us on with this. This is a, and I know these are big decisions, you know, for cities to kind of look at and see what do we do with these concession operations. And so one thing I want to say is you're not alone. You know, you're not the only, only city going, gosh, we have these great facilities, these beautiful beaches, and we have food there. And we don't know what to do with that because we're in the service business. We're in the service business of providing great facilities, great opportunities, and great things for our community. And what happens is, as you are experiencing, and many, many other park districts that we've worked with have, you're coming into that, what do we do with this? And part of it is we, we go, let me go backwards for just a second. I probably need to do a little introduction of who I am. So let me do that first, um, and then I'll get into that. Um, so I've been consulting since uh, for the last 20, uh, 28 years. Um, I have been in the restaurant business for 41 years. I'm 58 years old and I have consulted with over 650 projects, including 300 park districts over the last 28 years. I've spoken at NRPA since 1998 every year for the last 22 years speaking on food and beverage and no one has taken on food and beverage at NRPA except me. And what I mean by that is understanding captive market food, because that's what you are. You're different than a lot of restaurant operations where I have to, I'm sitting at a beach and I have a concession there and there's 500 people there or 300 people there, or maybe on a busy day in and out, a thousand people come, right? Much easier to run than a regular restaurant where you right now, all of you are sitting there making a decision about where you're going out for dinner tonight. And your decision makes a big difference to your community's restaurants and whether they survive or not. So, but a captive market, similar to a baseball stadium or a football stadium where you walk into that is a captive and therefore choose here. You can choose what we have to eat or you can choose nothing. And that's what captive market is. When you do a captive market menu that hits a home run, quality, execution, speed, these are big, big factors of this, and I'll communicate why in a little bit, and you're able to hit those, then you've got an opportunity to do even more to service your community. And that's what I think is really important. Here you have a beach that's so beautiful, and yet we're, and when I, when the, what was so neat is we walked in, 
and I'm looking at it, I go, wow, this is a really neat beach. And I get it. Look, we picked the perfect day, okay? 89 degrees, no wind, first day it was hot. You know, everybody's kind of coming to the beach. But when I sat down on the bench and a person sat next to me and I said, hey, how long have you been uh, in the community? Oh, I've been here 12 years. I swim here every day. We brought our kids. Great. So tell me about the concession. What concession? The concession that's right behind you that we're sitting on this bench from. Oh, oh that. Um, yeah, sometimes I get an ice cream with my kids, but I haven't gotten something probably in about four years. So as I'm walking down the beach and talking to more people, just kind of talk, just having those type of conversations, the feedback is, I didn't even know this was here of any type of entity or quality or as I'll say brand, right, of something there. So there it sits, yet despite that, it does an X number, a certain amount of volume, enough for a gentleman who's been there for 20 years to basically survive, to make it functional enough and financially viable enough for him to pay you $3,000 in exchange for running the operations. So. What's intriguing to me is that a lo what in, in 2016, I went and designed a water park and I designed a $54 million water park and I put in all the food operations for that park. I went to Thailand and designed a $100 million water park, putting in the kitchens and all the operations for those. Now I have the data of what menus work in these entities, what's effective in these locations, how to move 5,000 people and feed them in a very quick way with quality food. We're blowing away what Disney and SeaWorld does because I've worked for Disney and SeaWorld as a consultant for them, both of them. I worked for SeaWorld last year as a consultant for a multi, multi million dollar operation on how to speed up their food. We dial it down to Darien Beach over at Weed. We see a gentleman who stepped out there for one day and did a thousand dollars in sales by just sticking out a barbecue outside with no marketing, no signage, and just putting his stuff up and a thousand dollars of revenue they generated. So we know that if we operate this effectively, and that's what we documented in the report, with a really good plan, this can be really well done. So what happens in these situations is as an entity on Park and Rec, we go, you know, what's a lot easier is if we just sub this out, have someone else run it for it, take 10% of the revenue and call it a day, okay? What we've been educating on the last, especially the last 10 years, and there's been movement on this, is look, what if you're given the plan because you, ladies and gentlemen, concession operations that are seasonal are some of the easiest food operations to run compared to a year round restaurant, right? Just to compare. So when you have a seasonal concession business and you're looking for revenue and COVID, what we've been getting the feedback with is this, is that this is really in, interrupting our whole flow of cash and, and revenue into the park district. This is an opportunity as we got to look at it over the last three days for the city to potentially manage this. And, and what we see with that is that looking at Weed Beach, 90 days, looking over at Pear Tree and the opportunities of what can happen at Pear Tree, because I think there's different things that I know we're looking at, you know, do we do this construction? I know there's feedback from the homeowners about the, you know, it's gonna take away and it's gonna be lots of noise and everybody's, you know, we're gonna have a beach party here or something. You know, look, we're looking to, as, as you're looking to do this, provide a great service to your community. And part of it is giving them a kitchen, which doesn't work right now, is not functional, and therefore only serves basically bottled drinks and pre-made ice cream. And that's not a restaurant. And I don't want it to be a restaurant. I just want it to be something that we can serve something more than bottled drinks and pre-made ice cream. Um, I want to make, you know, what what I envision there is, is to, at Weed Beach especially, is a fresh barbecue outside, and you go to the window and you get your bun lettuce and tomato and you get your your hamburger and your chicken and your sa sa grilled salmon right off the grill and you take it back to your beach place. We're also gonna have fresh pizza in there that you can make in two minutes and 45 seconds that will equal the same pizza as you get at any pizza restaurant around. And you can also do a really neat Sunday bar because 79% of the people in there, in there in the survey said they wanted ice cream there. Well, right now they're getting a blow pop or a pre-made, uh, you know, something, one of the uh, uh, ice cream sandwich, something you can get anywhere. No excitement, nothing new. What if we really put in a soft serve ice cream and made some really neat trip to banana splits and sundaes and things? 
do you imagine when you hit the home runs with the food the right way, not what the baseball stadiums do now or pre they did 10 years ago. Here's a hot dog. Here's a popcorn. Here's a soda. Have a nice day. I'm not talking about that. Here's a fresh grilled hamburger. Here's a fresh made pizza. Here's a great ice cream that we just made for you. Here's a fresh funnel cake. Have a great day. And what that'll do is it's going to it's something that we don't even know we have that sits there and, and we can operate it. Can you have an outside operator do it? Absolutely. Would I recommend putting out an RFP for that to see what's going to come up? Because you as a city have the right to refuse every single proposal that comes that comes in. So let's go see. Let's go take. Let's go fish. Right. Let's go fish a little bit and let's see what's out there. As far as the equipment goes, the equipment value that's that restaurant equipment, what happens is you you buy a piece of equipment for eight thousand dollars, brand new sandwich table. You close after six months. You know the value of that sandwich table? Six hundred bucks. It drops ninety percent. Okay. You want to close your sell back your equipment, your restaurant, you will only get 10% on the dollar. So his value of his equipment that he has might be three thousand to four thousand dollars at the most and he can't do anything with it no one will come and take that stuff especially now because every restaurant that's tight is going to be closed in the next 30 to 90 days and or you know if, if this ppp goes away you're going to see things go awfully awfully rough and it's going to stop sometime that's going to open up a lot of used restaurant equipment and therefore that's going to be very available to us to make him a good offer that can be we're not we're not trying to take advantage of him we're just going to give him what the market value is which would be about three to four thousand at the most so now we're going to have a great equipment package you saw in the report we have some additional equipment that could be added to that by you or by another vendor um same with with pear tree and then the neatest opportunity of all that came out of this the beach is great but realizing that we were doing a calculation that we think there's about 200,000 people that come to the ballpark. That's three huge um, New York Giant games, okay? That's three New York Giant games that come to your place over a six-month period. There is a great opportunity financially on that if we hit the right foods. I talk to people there, I go, hey, what do you think of the food here? And they go, my goodness, I love dropping my son off and I've got my little one and we go play in the park. And But every time there's either no one here or it's not the food I want or the line's too long because they break the games at the same time, right? And so, so two teams get off with all the parents, two teams are waiting, two teams get on. Oh my gosh, what a nightmare. No can concession keep you up. So we talk to the, op, the, the your your person that operates a facility and say, hey, can we do a nine o'clock game, a 920 and a 940, and then rotate the fields like that? He's all, sure, we could do that. Great, now we've controlled the crowd. Then we're able to serve the, serve the foods that they want. And if we can get $2 a guest, which is a bottled water per person, that we could, we are all of a sudden in the, in the doing $400,000 there. So my th my belief about, concessions is if there's an opportunity where we've got numbers in people and we have because this is a numbers game if i can get a dollar per person and i have 200,000 people we do the math if i can get two dollars a person do the math my water park when it opened in 2016 got five dollars a guest 2017 seven dollars a guest 2018 eight dollars a guest last year 950 per person on 5,000 people, on 500,000 people there. 4.5 million in sales with my menus the way I designed them. So giving you this knowledge and experience and ability to make your operations awesome more than any other concessionaire can because we, I mean, we, we are opening four water parks in El Paso next year. I am training the, the outside vendor to run the operations based on my stuff. He's got 20 years of experience. Awesome. I can teach him in, in about you know a week of what we want to do, teach him how to do it and make him a lot of money. And so for an outside vendor to do that. So, but I told the city, <laughs> you should have done it yourself because when you look at page, what's the page on that report, Lori, of ours? Does everybody have a copy or not yet? Sorry, not Lori. Um, Jeez, I'm blanking out for a second. Pam, sorry, Pam. On, on, on the, does everybody have the report yet? You're muted, Pam. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Pam, yes. everybody has the report? So if yes. you look at page 11, 
if everybody can kind of look at page 11, and I think you'll understand a little bit more of what, what I see. And again, first of all, kudos to you and your park district for what you've done creating beautiful entities. Your baseball field, with the way that it's laid out as far as the, the, difference, the different elevations, the views that you can create, and the experience there is incredible. Actually, one of the top ballparks I've ever seen in any park district across the country. Everybody does a fourplex, and some of them do them pretty cool, but yours is phenomenal for experience. Shade and places to hang out and parks and all those things. So, you know, you have beautiful, beautiful entities. So if you look at the bottom line of this year one, year two, year three, and let me just tell you, I have also operated, um, I, I had a dream in 2003, in 2005, that I was going to go run 50 water parks for park districts across the country. That was my goal. Okay. And so I got up to 19 of them and I was, I was doing pretty well. And, but what happened is when I got out of state, I lost control. And so I couldn't do my dream. Didn't work. You try things sometimes they don't work. So, but I got to run operations, okay? So I'm not just talking as a consultant, I'm talking as an operator. When I share these numbers with you down here, I know as an operator that if I'm giving you more than 10 to 12% of my gross sales, I am pro I probably am not going to do very well after that because I have a 30% food cost minimum, 30% labor cost, 12% to you, taxes, insurance, other things I have to pay, and I might net out 10 to 12%. So to do all this work, as, an, as a vendor for only 10 to 12% is a lot of work. You look at the bottom line, does he want to do, he or she want to do all this work for $45,000? Because that's what they're going to net out, right? However, your PL, because we don't have other expenses that he does have to have, insurance, taxes, et cetera, your PL was basically food and labor, including your FTE. And, we, and when we build that, it or a seasonal employee to start. And when you look at those financial numbers, I get excited that, yes, you can take the sure thing and go, I'll have a vendor, he'll take care of it, I get $200,000 after three years, this will be great, okay? Or if you manage it yourself, you could get five times that. In fact, you could get six to eight times that and maybe even 10 times that because I'm trying to be conservative with these numbers and I can share stories with you of stuff that we do that blows people away. Because I want to just imagine this for yourselves. If you walk up to a concession at a beach and I provide with you a fresh grilled hamburger, a fresh grilled salmon sandwich, a fresh grilled, a fresh breaded chicken tender, just as good as Cane's. If I provide you with a funnel cake that tastes really good and I for your kids and a really great ice cream sandwich sundae, or with a Sunday that with, with banana split that's just overflowing, those five in, items alone, and you're sitting at a beach, why would you ever bring a picnic? Why would you bring a picnic? That's all there for you, fresh made at all at reasonable prices. You will have lines that's not talking about a $2 cut per, per cap per person. You could have three, four, five, six dollars a person and blow these numbers away that I have in this report. So I'm trying to be conservative and showing that your potential is huge and you know the risk is an is 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 a seasonal employee it's very difficult to go backwards you can always have somebody run your operations but you can't always have your operations run you can't come back three years from now and go wow that guy's making bank i'm gonna get him out and now we're gonna run it so the opportunity is now because you're you have a, you have the the uh, entity on your on your docket and it's yours and you can still run the RFP and see what's out there and see what people bite so that you can get a sense of what they what are they thinking what are they what's their what's their objective what menus do they want to do what are they thinking about we finally finally see that McDonald's or sorry that KFC is going with chi with plant based chicken did you see that Pam they just brought it out KFC went with plant based chicken okay. There's a movement with healthier foods. Carl's Jr., Hardee's in your area, with plant-based burger. Burger King has been promoting it. For, there was nothing called plant-based food nine months ago. Nothing. Nobody had any of it. All of a sudden now, it's moving that it has to be, that we've got to put in these fresh products. And I, I will, I, you will watch over the next two to five years that fast food is going to change to fresh fast food because what they're serving now is garbage. 
And when we can serve fresh food at your at your operations, and it can be you, your team, and it's not hard to do it when someone gives you a playbook. Here's the playbook. Here's where you buy the burger. Here's where you buy the pizza. Here's where you buy the ingredients. And you hand somebody that manual. And that's what we did with the, with the Park District at Glenwood. I worked with Mike McCarty there. And he was, he, he was in the same meeting, actually, Pam, that you were three years ago. And he said, why don't you come teach us how to run the water parks? And I went out there for a season. We spent four consulting days and, the, and set them all up for success. And the previous years, they had lost 19000 in their water parks over two seasons. And now they're making over $75,000 in their parks in two seasons with self-managing it with people that are, that are decent. They're not awesome food and beverage people, but they're decent. And that's all that you need because when you have a playbook, then it's easy. When you don't have a Mike. playbook and someone says, Kathy, go make a pizza. And you got to go find the sauce, find the cheese, find the crust. Who's going to buy it? Where am I going to put all that stuff? Where I say, here's the sauce, here's the cheese, here's where you buy it, here's the vendor, here's the price. And when all that's done for you, then all you have to do is order it. So, so just kind of looking through from that angle. Pam, you have a question. Yeah, Mike, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to the survey and what you you saw and how you in, incorporated that in your analysis. Yep, that's a good question. So I do have a page of, of a couple of the things that we definitely keyed in on um, from the survey. And I think that, you know, healthy choices was definitely one of the big pieces of this. Now, I want to ba back that up a little bit because all of us talk about healthy choices. And there are times that maybe when we're at the beach with our family that might not be the mo that might not be the time that we're right, making a salad with uh you know with this grilled asparagus okay this might be my moderation meal or my cheat or something of that nature because when i'm with my family like that that's not necessarily the time but when people say the word healthy choices if you look at the word chicken tenders which what which is what we found is a fresh chicken piece of chicken that we have a batter that we dip in and fresh, and you can hold that for days. I take a fresh chicken, I batter it, and I put it aside. Buying a frozen nugget when and the definition of a nugget is sixty is forty percent chicken and sixty percent in, injected fat basically is what a nugget is. I don't want to serve that, so I'm going to meet this healthy choices demand by doing fresh one hundred percent ground beef burgers, fresh um salmon that we can do for the grilled fish and then fresh you know chicken that we serve with fresh tenders that way so when we're doing those both four items much healthier than what you get at any fast food place and people did want healthier stuff and i think that we can fit into that and as and when i talk we i'm not talking about me i'm talking about you as a city that we work as a team to help you that's all i want to make that really clear i don't want to operate your facilities i have no interest in that I have an interest in educating you so that you can be successful operating your facilities, okay? So this is not about self-serving Mike. This is about serving you because when I look at the bottom line numbers, if I was in your shoes and I could make almost a million dollars instead of 180 grand, someone else running it, I'll take the risk and go for it. That's how I look at it. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Um, what food items would you most likely see? You can see the purple one definitely was ice cream, the one that stands out the most of all. Burgers and dogs were were up there, um, yeah, along with chicken. Like all of the proteins were right there in that spot. Um, and then, you know, what I love about this and people saying is that candy so low, so low in the bottom. We don't even serve candy at any of our facilities. I can get a Snicker bar anywhere, but I can't get a fresh made sundae on the beach. And that's why we want to do that experience instead. I want to get a nice big shave ice on the beach instead. And then, you know, with people listing the others of just items that they wanted. Um, you know, pear would be great to be a great like little morning coffee spot where you just kind of can get that coffee in the morning. And then as we put in the report, it can be just like a little simple seafood operation there potentially, you know, doesn't require anything big, just like a nice little shrimp cocktail, nice little smoked salmon or grilled salmon, you know, things that we could do that'd be really simple, don't require a lot of square footage um, to be able to handle that. And then the third question we had in the survey, um, you know, was just they, they mentioned more in terms of having more variety. Um, we get locked. The, the challenge of other concession, the concession business, is it's always preconceived that it's supposed to be like a 7 Eleven. You go in, you grab a bag of chips, a pre made ice cream, a soda, you leave. Okay. The model, though, doesn't work in most places as a restaurant because 7 Eleven runs with one employee. 
And when you're trying to run a concession at a beach, you're not running it with one employee. So when you're serving pre-made ice cream like that, that's a 50% cost of goods, that's why that gentleman struggles. Doesn't make a lot of money, he makes only some money. So being able to provide the variety there, I think is, is pretty easy to do in what I've described to you with the menu. Because I'm hitting you with pizza and grill and you know what, what else are we missing? We got chicken, fish, and steak. I've got them all covered. Um, so it can be you, it can be a vendor, and the choice is definitely yours. What you what I'm trying to give you here that I see in a lot in your operations is because of the numbers and the potential number of people you have, you have a great chance to be very, very successful. And in these days, and you look at your budgets moving forward, this money is really, really important. I know and I'll, I'll answer this question because I know it's going to come up. We're in the park district business, not the restaurant business. Why are we even considering this? Right. That's something that always comes up in these scenarios. Wait, we're going to compete with our community on this. We are in captive market locations where they a person has a choice, either purchase the food from our concession and who built the beach, by the way? Who's maintaining the beach? Who's taking care of the beach? Who's taking, who's the, why do we, who's paying for the security at the beach? You are, the city's paying for all that, right? So handing some, who built the building? You did. So why are we handing somebody else that building? Did you know that they do outsource the concessions at the ballpark at the giant stadium and that they get 60% of the revenue? The NFL gets 60% of the revenue. That's why you pay, pay $12 for a beer and $9 for a hot dog at a stadium like that. Because they got to give them 60% of the money and then make their stuff. So you have great potential with these things. And it's not about being in the business and competing. It's about being in the business to support your park and rec agency and make revenue for you and to Ooh. offset the cost that you have. Pam, ahead, did you have Lori. a question? Yeah, Lori does. She's been trying to no, get I in. Yeah, no, I just, I would like to have the opportunity to just start opening it up for, for questions from the commission. I know I have a very lengthy list of questions. Uh, we received email questions that were similar. I know my commission members have questions. So, um, you know, thank you for the, the, the presentation. And I, th I think at this point, you know, I'd like to maybe have that opportunity for, for my commission members to start um, diving into so, to some of the questions they have. And I'll certainly let them go first and see how many they tick off before I, um, jump in with some of mine. So um, anybody on the okay. commission want to jump in yeah. with their first question? Yes. Mike, um, you have uh, a manager listed here. I, I'm i assuming that you want the town to hire the manager, but you would then train that person. Is that correct? So that's, that's the opportunity of it, yes. When someone has a food and beverage background, I don't need to give them too much training or our team doesn't need to give them too much training to be able to do this um, because it's not very difficult when you're given the map. If I, if I give you the specific items to order and to order it from and what it's going to cost and negotiate that on your behalf, then that's all set in place. It's really like, kind of like a franchise. You know, it's, it's your own franchise of things. But in answering your question, we can teach you or your food and beverage person can take it as far as they can. But again, usually we don't need to be there much time to show them once they're given the roadmap. So you provide the plan, the playbook, so to speak, but we would be responsible for hiring yeah. that person. We can even help with that. And we've done that quite a bit. In fact, here's the thing that happens with that. Let's say you're going through the interview process, okay? and you're looking at your last five or three, three to five candidates. I love being part of the interview for a couple of reasons. One, I'm gonna ask questions that no one else, else will ask, okay? Just from my background. More importantly, they meet us and they meet us in the interview process. Hey, we're gonna be your support system. If you're brought on board for this, you're gonna get support throughout this process to help you set up these operations to be successful. And that's part of us instead of, hey, we hired somebody and that guy, Mike Holtzman from PFF is gonna help you. Hey, wait a second, you hired me. Why do, you, why, am I, why do I have to work with him? So when we've been involved in the process, that noise goes away. And that way we're part of the interview and been part of having them get hired and be successful with that. So in fact, it's, it's a good thing to have us involved in it, which can just be a Zoom call like this and we're all on and we're all asking questions and I've got a couple of questions, you know, so that's how the, that works pretty well.
Mary Louise, do you have other questions or should yeah, I turn what, over? What is what is your percentage? I don't I, here's the thing that I'm doing with this. I don't want to make a percentage. And I'll tell you why, Mary, honestly, because the two times I've done contracts like that, I blew the number so far away that no one wanted to pay me. I'm talking that we took an operation from 44,000 to 350,000 in one season and they didn't want to pay me the bonus. So I, I set it up just as a contractual original, you know, just a setup of consulting fees that you'll make back in your first season. Okay. So, so you I, I mean, I just, we, fees and then you're available yes. throughout the season. If this manager has particular questions or needs help. Yeah. yeah. And I'm and and so it's not just me, as as Mary or as sorry, as far as Pam was saying, Krista, uh, Nicole and and Josh who came out for this with this process as well are operating a facility right now. They operated a water park last season, so they 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 negotiated all of the pricing. They put in the manuals. They're doing videos. These are millennials that are super sharp, and so those tools will all become yours. And and so you don't have just Mike as the resource; you have my team as the resource. So you're, if Mike's doing something, you know, we you have some other people to go to. We stay with you as long as you want. If he calls us or she calls us next year and has a question, we answer it. And you know that's how I've stayed in business for 28 years through everything, even a COVID. So um, you know that's we that's we want you to be successful. That's how we get. So they can call up Pam and say, "Hey, how's this Mike guy?" And we want to be—they they, just, you know, she raves so much about it. That's how we become successful when you're successful. How many Mike? people do okay. you estimate you would need at each location, particularly since you're offering such a varied menu, and everything's being made specially to order? Right, and there's and the the trick about that is there's the systems. So when I had that water park that we did with the 5,000 people, right, and I'm I'm sitting here as and trying how do we feed 5,000 people? And 5,000 people don't come at 12. You know, there's a stagger, but there's a good chunk of people that want to eat between 11:30 and 1:30. So we know that's a couple thousand people. That's why this. So imagine, I want you to imagine this grill operation. So say, picture yourself at the beach, and right now what you do is you walk in and you, you talk to a guy, and then you go over to the side and you wait, right? And if they've got eight or nine orders, you're going to be 30 minutes for your food right now. That's how he's set up. He can't do anything else. We're going to enclose that operation and everybody's going to come to the windows outside the operation. We're going to have two to three POS in there. Okay. POS is what slows everything down because when I get a ring in your order, that takes forever. That takes two to three minutes. That's only 20 per hour. When I do the grill, I hand you a bun, lettuce, and tomato, an order of fries and a drink, and I send you to the grill. So that's a flow where I take out the proteins and now it becomes very easy as an operation. You're gonna, you, we, we are implementing this or we've implemented this at our parks and, and I'm able to do $4,000 an hour at our water park in one hour with the fresh grill outside. If the grill was inside, we couldn't do more than 1800. So yeah, I'm having trouble visualizing processes. where we would put an outdoor grill at Weed Beach. I, I'm really struggling with where that would even go you've got, a, you've got a great location because you've already got the step down coming onto the beach and they did a grill actually off to the side on the concrete which is fine i if if i if i could have my druthers with it i'd love to push it to take your current decking and then push the decking out to the right and to the left so that you could have tables with umbrellas tables with umbrellas create marketing and people go oh look there's food over there you don't do that meant you don't do that in externally you do that internally right look there's food over there so it's advertising and then the fresh grill is is smell marketing we call it yeah because but based, there's based the on what we on. have now assuming we can't get a dollar to expand a deck uh, wh where would that go and my concern is safety that you've got kids and people with very little clothing on and there's a hot grill right there we, we fence it off always and again if, if, if i if you we could always show you how we do this at other facilities and where where we've done it i've done it at more than 100 operations now with this outdoor grill operation and safety is number one concern we want to make sure that that grill is nowhere near anybody that could ever get to touch it or anything like that so okay all right well let's we not get that. too diverted into that um let me open it up to other commission members for questions um, um i just want to mention one thing 
just so everyone can hear this, but today at Weed Beach and at Pear Tree, we have an open grill. We do. So yes, Brian at Rory's has an open grill and then kitchen, uh, Jennifer's Kitchen is at Pear Tree with an open grill. So they are outside the concession stands and they are freshly grilling everything to order. And they are nicely blocked off with tables. Okay. So if you're around this weekend, take a look. They're out there operating and they're doing very well. Okay. Mike, uh, this is Susan Daly. Um, I want to thank you for uh, your presentation. It's very informative. Can you go over a little bit about the equipment cost and capital that we're going to have to invest in as a town? Because I mean, I see the profit and you know the sales and the labor, but I think we need to, as a town, figure out the amount of investment we need to get to get there. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, and that's a really great question. We did outline in that in the report. Um, a couple of things. One that that I, I really feel I can let you know when I had my operations and I sold the equipment back to the city, I got 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. OK, so that's how I know that we got to that number. His equipment is even much older than mine. So a lot of the equipment, what's great is that you already have a lot of it to put yourself in the pizza oven, to put yourself in the pizza business. You have the tables, you have the refrigeration, you have the freezer, you have the dry storage and you have the building. All you need is the oven. And the pizza oven is ten thousand dollars and i know that may sound like a lot but when you can sell pizzas for you know nine to seven to nine dollars a piece you can pay for this oven in about 30 to 60 days um so that's the that's the main investment at both of the uh, both entities is a pizza oven at each one but we're going to be able to possibly even use one pizza oven between both operations because of the timing of when baseball is busy and when the what and when the uh, uh weed beach is busy because we can move it you know, June 15th to August 30th, and then the ballpark can have it from April to June 15th and August 30th to close. So we can even utilize that one oven to start, and then we can do other things with it. The capital, though, is because you've already got a lot of the tools, um, is basically in the 25,000 range for each facility. And then Pear is new, so Pear is a new build out, and would and we need and we have to build the operation first and then put the equipment in. Um, so there is more capital with pair uh just because of what you know that we're starting with a fresh building but that's all part of your budget there in terms of the building itself um that's already been built into that um so there's the, the but the equipment at those first two facilities that are already existing is actually pretty minimal there's a lot of times we walk in and go yeah wow we got to spend 100 grand at each place to even make a go of this you're not in that range anywhere near that range you're in the 20,000 range uh, per facility, including the grill operations, including the setups. So that to be at the potential that you're going to jump, you know, to the numbers that we're showing pays this back literally year one, if not weeks into the season. Hi, this um, is, okay. right, go ahead, Susan. I just had a quick question, Mike. Since you seem to be very familiar with how you work with Parks and Rec staff, I know that you have a manager on site. But how much time do you think someone like Pam or maybe Jim will be spending on managing you guys uh, or the, I mean, the, I mean, the concessions, I should say. You know, and, and I'll be, I want to be very transparent with this part because I'm, and I'm, I'm really trying to be transparent with all of it, but let's talk about the staffing part because that's, that's probably the, the little, the little crux of this. And, and it is with anything because when we say, hey, we're going to need another, you know, part timers, probably 15 people at the beach. Um, and probably 12 to 15 at the ballpark as well. So those are not full FTEs. Those are all hourlies because they're seasoned. This is the nice part from a park and rec side. We can keep them under the 1500 hours and we won't have to do any benefits for them because the parks are, are no more open than six, six months. We can't even get to those hours even if they were working full time. You, you're, the people want to, I mean, the one thing we've seen is that people want to work in park districts, that's for sure. And finding people in concessions really hasn't been too hard as long as we have good systems. You know, people just want to be able to be successful, right? I want to be, and when they say, oh yeah, we're out of that again, or oh my gosh, the line is 40 deep and I got to cook. No, that's the part that we educate on how to do all of those things faster so that you like to work at the place, you know? And so the feedback I got from Mike McCarty when they put when they put in our systems for the water park, they didn't lose any staff. They got more returning staff every season because, the, because it was really easy and fun to work in the environment with my friends. You know, that's what kids are looking for these days. So with good systems 
good tasting food that you're proud to serve, that makes your job really easy in this concession side that you want to be there instead of you have to be there because mom said so, you know? So um, that's what we've been seen with our operations. Are there more people? Yes, but you only need one FTE in this whole thing. Um, even with all your operations running, you know, simultaneously on some days, um, will you need a lead there? Sure. Someone to understand what's going on? Absolutely. Um, but again, the, the, the upside to me is you can't make that kind of money in a New York restaurant, you know, that's you can at a concession. That's how great your opportunity with this. And yet the food is super easy compared to what they have to do. You know, it's like the perfect storm in the food and beverage business. Okay, we want to keep moving more questions, Lori? Uh, yes, I'd like to keep going. I think Kathy had questions, unless Susan, did you have any more? Susan? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, I'm fine. Kathy. Hi, and, and Mike, thank you so much. Your presentation was great and really thorough. Um, did we can did you consider um, actually doing this in a phased in fashion? It seems like it's a lot to take on for the town, to take on all three at once. Did you consider whether whether the opportunity is as strong for the town if we did one at a time and, and phase it in to see how we can ramp it up on a, maybe on a smaller sort of trial basis? Yeah, there's there the, the part that's nice is that it is a little bit phased because we're not going to open them all at the same time, right? Baseball opens first and we get eight weeks to practice that and then we get to move that really similar food to the beach. So I, I agree with you. We could, we could take it on as, you know what, let's just do weed in 2021. Let's leave everything else the same. Let's do weed in 2021. Let's see how it goes. Let's see how we do. If we don't like it, we can RFP and hand it off in 2022, right? If we do, and, and that's the way I approach the FTE, by the way. This is a great, great job. And and again, whether it's and the way I would approach it is year one is seasonal, Mr. FTE, or I'm sorry, seasonal employee. You want to become an FTE? Depression. So I think that this can be phased in with you know doing that though that that the first season, and then moving to you know pair isn't probably going to be built anyway that quickly. Um, so we're going to have time there anyway. We can open it just as a simple coffee house year one if we have to if it opens, but if not, we can phase this in. So yeah, it's definitely feasible. Um, and did you do a cost sort of comparison analysis? It might not have been part of your scope between doing outsourcing this versus doing it in house and, and actually running it ourselves. Because you can well, use the, the, a good charge of fee yeah. to the vendor to actually operate. So there could be revenue that would be brought into the town in that type of proposal as well. Share that last part again, the, the, what the operator, I missed that. So similar, um, to give you some background, I'm an attorney and I've done a lot of sponsorship deals. So I've done a lot of nice. deals with ballparks and a lot of deals with football stadiums and, and concession stands. Oh, so, okay. so there is, you can, the town could charge a fee to a vendor um, and to operate it at Weed Beach or at Pier Tree Point or at McGuan. Um, and they would pay sort of instead of it, in addition to a flat fee, they could get a proportion of the profits and they could structure a deal that way as well. Um, so there could be some revenue that comes into the town if they decided to RFP it as well. And I just didn't know if that was something that people looked at or not. So that's that's true. That is a possibility. The challenge with it is that it has to be monitored. Someone has to monitor it. Um, and there, and and we have, and it's, and that's also a problem with even what we have with the percentage basis, right? Is that that has to be, someone has to monitor that as well too, um, to some level. So yes, we can do it on an on additional, additional profit basis. We've done models like that. Um, but I think that the part that I challenge that is that it creates more work on our end of having to be you know, in that vendor's numbers and seeing what he's doing and making sure it's legit. Because it being that this is a cash business and I mean, how many, working in New York and you know this, how many dollar New York pizza operations, they're, they're doing dollar pizzas because it's all cash <laughs> and we don't know what's happening with the numbers, just as an example, right? I'm walking the streets in New York, I'm like, how can they, oh, because he hits keeping the no sale button. That's how he's ringing it up. Gotcha. Um, now he's giving me change, but that's how it's moving. So I'm not saying that's going to happen in Darien, 
or anywhere else, but it happens. And, you know, I like it that if that's going to be going on on a percentage basis, someone's really going to have to be watching it and monitoring it to make sure it's legit. Okay. And um, just for in the survey, my last point, I think the mom who would eat, who would have to eat dinner sometimes at, at the um, the ballpark, having a salad there would be great. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of parents who would love to have healthier meals at the ballpark. I spent my, probably five or six years having dinner there. So um, just even for your kids, I think having more stuff and more things available would be great. And I hear it all. I used to hear it all the time when Jack played there. So mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, commission members, who's next with questions? Tierra, Lucy? Hi, Mike. This is Tierra now speaking. Thanks so much, Mike, for coming on here. Um, I was just had a question about your experience with food trucks. And mm. yes, anything you can say about that. Because um, right now we... Our, our zoning, um, they can't idle for longer than five minutes. Um, but yeah, I would just be curious what's your, what's your experience with that. So what, what I've, it, this is actually, we did, here's what's funny. 2019, my title of my speech was, should we get a food truck at our park district? I did an hour and a half session on that. Um, because you, it, to, here's, I mean, here's my, let me give you my vision of it. Three, year, three years into this, you, you, you're doing so well that it's time to get your own food truck because what do we do with our person between October and, and February? We get our own city food truck, city Darien food truck, and we move it around to all of our seasonal events. And even when we have other things going on like fireworks shows or anything that we have, we move our food truck to that. And it's a, it's a versatile food truck so that we're not always locked into a certain concept. We can have flexibility with that. We have had three park districts that I know of that have gone in as depth into this depth with extreme success. The good news though about what you have already is you have three finished, no, sorry, two finished kitchen buildings. Pear is a marginal kitchen building. Um, so you do have three, but I give you two very good ones that literally 40,000 in investment puts you in the main restaurant business phase and you don't need a food truck at those facilities. So I would take the investment in the food truck and put it in the equipment because I already have the buildings there and everything's set. I just need a couple more pieces to put out the menu that I described. So the food truck then would be from the so much success of the operations that in year four, you're ready to do it and pull the trigger on that to enhance what you've already done in your community because you're gonna be a brand you know, within a few years of going, wow, our city produces great food. Look at there's their food truck. We'll get something from that too. That's how I would see it being used. Uh, I, so this is Lucy. I just I have one question, and if you covered it, I'm so sorry if I missed it because I felt like we were talking stuff. And you did such a nice job, Mike. My God, I didn't realize quite a presentation without any to visually look at. I thought you painted a perfect story. Um, question: We talked a lot about about the successes, but I'm wondering about any pitfalls um to that you've seen from other you, you know um parks and recs or any you know your history of, of doing this for however many plus years you said uh pandemics yeah that's a definite pitfall <laughs> um i mean again imagine with kathy negotiating these these deals with the you know with these huge concessionaires um how unfair is that um weather is definitely an issue. You, if we have a bad summer, and and that's that can that can create a little bit more in the incremental side, a little bit of being unlucky. Um, I I worked with a pumpkin patch group that does really well, great on September 15th to October 31st, and last year they rained every Saturday and five of the Sundays. So that's not even fair, right? To even to but those are pitfalls because that's reality. So we are a little bit weather dependent. You know, if we have a great summer, we can have a great year. If we're not, we're not. Um, a little bit with the person, we have to get a little, a little lucky with finding a, a good manager with this, but it's concession. We're not looking for a chef. We're looking for someone with, you know, really a, just a, a, a great personality to, to really follow our stuff. Um, 
and and they'll be extremely successful with it if they follow it and then they get to deviate from it from there so personnel is a little bit of an issue um uh you know climate is yeah. is part of it um that's that's really the biggest things because marketing because you said market? you know how people didn't even realize that that was there and stuff like that i mean just this you know, and, and we do, I think, a good job of getting communications out, but I just wonder, does it need to be more? Like, you know, I mean, one thing that I never understood about Juan when I drove out the baseball is like, I never knew if it was going to be open. It was very sporadic, so to speak, right? Because okay. you said, right, somebody wouldn't show up or this, that, and the other. That's the hard part is that if you, you, you know, going out, I mean, I know if I go out to eat and I go to a restaurant and it's closed that day because they have a party or closed that day because some, whatever, you are certainly off my list because I can't trust that we spent all this time picking you and then you're not there. So you're right. Consistency is a very important part of this that we know that if you're going to take the time to take our kid to ball field at five o'clock and you didn't stop somewhere in the way because we knew we could get something to eat there and then it's closed, then you can't trust that anymore. And now you're going to eat every time before you go. So that is important that we have specific hours that we're open. And, you know, the nice things about these operations, they can be dialed up and they can be dialed down. I can run it with two people. I can run it with eight people on a busy tournament. I can run it with one POS and one cook in the back, or I can run it with three POS two cooks, a grill guy outside, a runner and a manager because we're that busy, you know, so I can dial it up or dial it down depending on how busy we are. So that's the good thing. That's the where this works financially to concessions only. Again, a, a restaurant requires more. So not too many. That's that's the pitfalls that I see. If you look at it from just put everything away and go, what's the risk of all this? The risk is an FTE, right? That's what's on the table we're, and the equipment, the initial investment of of the equipment and the and the FTE that's that's the risk that if we do nothing we've got another 100,000 on our hands oh my gosh what happens but the potential because of your numbers you know is is really exciting to me you know really really exciting that we try to be conservative with these things um that I can I can I mean if you ever wanted a list of references of ball fields and uh, aquatics or beach facilities that we've taken on that you can go talk to the directors so you can understand what what happened there I'd be happy to give you that list you know because they are we're all sitting exactly like all of you are right now quandering this going do we do this or not do we take this on or not do we just hand it off or not and the first question I ask at NRPA every year is how many of you raise your hands if you have a vendor running your operations and at your concessions and I'll get 70 percent of the people in the room to raise their hand and I say, keep your hand up if you're super happy with the relationship and it's going great. And I have one hand stay up and the rest are all down. All of them are down because they don't know as much as they should know about what they do and how they do it. You may run a great restaurant, but you don't know concessions. Then guess what happens? Something goes wrong and guess who gets the letters? Pam does. I can't believe what's going on at the beach. Um, well, we're a third, we're not even running the thing. Oh, you're not even running the thing, great. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 this us and them and it separates instead of it being a team. You know, we take responsibility for our own stuff, but if it doesn't go well, it's the park district's fault. And and that's not a really fun and fun place to be in if this guy, the person's like a six or a seven, like they do okay, but they're not great, you know? So then what do you do? You gotta keep them for as long as a contract and then what do you, I mean, so we, like we, that's what I mean. We get one shot at this with this person and if we if we take a shot and do it ourselves, I think there's more opportunity. So, hey Mike, that makes sense. Is, uh, Mike, okay. this is this is Mike Scro. Uh, could we spend a couple of minutes and just talk about the numbers that you have in the in the presentation and in, in the deck that you've given us the report yep. uh, on page Absolutely. eleven? So maybe you could just help us understand how you arrived at the numbers. So kind of the underlying metrics. You know, what baseline are you working with? I can just tell you, you know, kind of on the surface. <laughs> They look uh, kind of, you know, just a bit overly optimistic. If I can, uh, if I can just put it in that way. So, and quite honestly, what I would have liked to have seen was maybe like a best case, worst case, likely case, um, uh, you know, and maybe. So, if you could just kind of start with a little bit of an understanding, and then maybe drill down a bit more on this and help us understand, like, what are we really talking about here? Well, I think that, you know, I'll tell you what I what I go based upon is is uh, per cap. 
Okay, that's the number that I try and talk. Per, per cap is dollars spent per person at the location. Um, so when I take Weed Beach year one, and it was really great that Pam got some numbers for us right away um, from the vendor that was there. So here comes a vendor that shows up at your beach with no marketing, nobody knows who they are, they have a grill set outside with a chalkboard menu board. No one, and yes, it's on your website. I get that, but you know, I, I I usually don't read the web when I go to the beach before I go to the beach, and it doesn't matter whether they did or not. But like, there wasn't a lot go knowing that they were there, and they did a thousand bucks. Okay. But let me try to make it. So let me try to make it simple. Let me just. I'm sorry. I try, try, sorry to cut you off, but let me just try okay. to make it simple. So these numbers for year one. Um, and I'm yep. guessing you're probably using some simple math under the surface here. So tell me, tell us how many folks per day, per month, at like what particular item cost are we talking about that gets us to these these numbers? Is that kind of the the way you've approached it, or I'm just trying to understand like what yeah, what I, is the methodology for how you got to the numbers? I got I we we did get to see the 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 current vendor had left his notebook in the in the operation and we got to look at his financials briefly which is just his revenue of what he did like last season right so I got to kind of peek at that um so that gave me some help um I also took a lot of what we do in terms of per cap in terms of numbers and that's why I feel that this is extremely conservative it it, if you take the number of people at Weed Beach, I feel that there's at least basically 50,000 people there at least per seat per year. Um, we know his busiest day last year was $2,500. And I would guess that that would be a thousand person beach day, okay? That that would be, in and out would be a thousand people um, on, on his busiest 4th of July weekend day. <clears throat> if he did a thousand people, he did a $2.50 per cap. And with his flow, that's all he could do. When we run operations with our stuff, we are able to go two to three fold on what other operations are performing at. So, um, and I know that just blows you away, Mike. I mean, it, it does to me. You know, I mean, you can say, here's a guy no, no, sitting here and telling <laughs> I, you that. I, I, no, 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 I, I appreciate no, I just, it. I don't, I'm, it's, I'm, not, I'm not blown away. I'm just really trying to understand. Yeah. But, because when you're, two, two when you're gone, and you're, said, well, hold on, hold, Mike, was, please, just give me one second. You know, when this call is over and you're not with us and we're kind of convening amongst ourselves trying to figure out what you've shared with us, I think yeah, yeah. we're going to end up trying to drill down on the numbers, you know. So I, I don't know if it's possible for you to do this um, kind of after the fact, but I, I think if you could just help us understand, like, take this chart and translate this chart into kind of, you know, number of visits per day. Uh, you know, kind of the individual charge or, you know, units that an individual is purchasing, you know, get each visit. Like, I'm having just really a hard time. Like, I call me cynical or, or <laughs> but I'm just having a really hard time understanding, like, what this translates into for us. You mentioned, as an example, I'll give you what troubles me a little. You gave us the number for Maguan as an example of 200,000, um, I guess, folks in a season. I'll, I'll trust you on that, um, but I don't see how you get to that because that's 33,000 people a month. Um, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I just may not appreciate just how much, that's over six months, I may not appreciate just how many people we have coming to our ball field. And that's a, that's really eye-opening for me. So I just like to understand, I think it would just be helpful for all of us if we're going to make a decision. Because I guess the other way I would say I'm looking at this is, I, I see this kind of as an initial step. And by the way, I really do appreciate I don't know if you remember, but I was the fellow that met you when we were at Pear Tree when you were visiting, and I sat with you in the, oh, you know, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. 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 So, and um, so I, I really do appreciate the work that's gone into this. It's clearly you've got a tremendous amount of experience. I think the trick is how does this translate to our town, and more specifically, I think you know you you've got to give us kind of the you're giving us some direction. We got to figure out how to translate the direction you're giving us into the reality of it because. You spent a few hours with us, you know, we're, we're living here. So I think it's kind of natural that we're going to challenge and kick the numbers around a little bit. And, um, and the numbers are an important, important part of it. I mean, one other aspect of this is I'm not sure how much we're motivated. It's a question we all have to share amongst ourselves by profit. Um, but we're certainly motivated by service quality and, you know, providing some level of service to the town at some level. So at any rate, I would just say we don't have to go into it now. 
but if that was something you could do for us, you know, kind of offline and get it back to Pam and just help us to understand how you built the numbers from the bottom up, I think that, that would certainly be very, very helpful for me. Uh, in yeah, terms of the learning well, experience. I'd, really, I'd really like to echo that. Um, I'm a 40 plus year banker, so I challenge every number. That's what I'm, I'm trained to do. Um, so I was very interested and had lots and lots of notes and questions. And I, I don't, it's already almost nine o'clock and I don't want to spend the time going through the numbers, but you know, what I would really like to see is detail really that supports each one of the revenue figures, you know, how many people average ticket, how many months in the you know, season, um, food costs. I thought the margins seem, you know, the ultimate margin seemed very high for me for a food business. Um, and then there was labor cost. I didn't see anything in terms of, you know, supplies, cleaning, depreciation. I mean, all the other types of expenses that would also be incurred. So I, I, I think we're going to need more detail on these numbers to even think about them. Um, and then I think Mike's, you know, point is well taken is that we're not necessarily in this for the profit is to supplement the services at the beach, but there are a lot of other considerations. I mean, you know, we're not, we were trying to balance that with not, you know, driving too much traffic to the beach, frankly, you know, both of our beaches are on one way or, or limited access streets, things like that. So there's many, many other considerations in, beyond that I would probably say would take precedence over making the most money. Um, but okay, definitely, okay. if you could come back to us and really provide the support and the footnotes to those numbers, I think that would be really important. And we got, a, you know, some of the folks who are listening in our um, constituents were already emailing us those same questions today about really um, wanting to understand the detail behind how those numbers were arrived at. Well, and, and uh, first of all, to me, profit is is a result, not a goal, right? Profit is a result of doing really good business. It's not a goal of of doing it that so when things go well this is what happens in terms of results um i want to be a little bit careful because you know we were asked to do an analysis and to do a break a big big breakdown of this is going to take a number of hours of time that wasn't necessarily in our agreement part i mean so i'll break it down somewhat but a lot of it is pretty simple per cap going off of the concept we run 22 20 to 22 percent concession operations i put yours at 24. i put labor at 35 that's including your manager. A restaurant rule of thumb is 30, 30, 30, 10, 30 food, 30 labor, 30 other, and 10% profit. The advantage in a park district is you don't have the other, okay? You don't have a rent expense because it's your operations. You don't have depreci depreciation because it's already depreciated. You don't have utilities because you don't calculate it to the food anyway right now. You know, so a lot of the things that would be built in there aren't part of your P&L. That's why I didn't put it in. And that's, so are they really part of your B&L? To some degree, yes. And there's lots of ways to do accounting for this as a food and beverage. But when you're doing this on your simple P&L operations in a park district, from my experience, it's basically food cost and labor cost and all the labor costs that are associated with that, meaning uh, benefits and anything else, the FTE numbers, right? That's part of, and that's it because the rest of it drops to the bottom line. So that's why we did that simple of a P&L was coming from that perspective. Um, and all of the revenue numbers are based upon per caps, so based upon what I, we met with your baseball person, we sat down together and said, hey, give me a tournament, how many people, where do we see this? And that's how we came up with 200,000 number and doing it at a buck 25, which is how we came up with the numbers that we have, and then increasing to $2, that's how we came up with that. You know, So I can put a kind of a, a, a tsunami or a synopsis of that, of how we came up with it, because I know how we did, um, but I just don't want to go into a seven-page, you know, financial thing because we're we're that that will take us a number of time that we didn't necessarily plan for. But I can definitely give you the, you know, certainly the highlights of that, and I think that should get you started. Okay, other commission members. I'm trying to scan the names on the screen to see if everybody got a chance to ask questions. Atier did. Mike, Susan, Kathy, Mary Louise, Lucy. Am I forgetting anybody? I don't want to forget anybody. Okay. I'm on. Uh, this is Sarah. I'm on here. I don't have oh, any questions Sarah. for Mike. Thank, thank you so much for um, the presentation. I think we'll have a lot of discussion as a commission um, about what direction we want to go in based on this information and what might be best for our town. Not a city, we're a town. So, um, but I do appreciate your help. 
Thank you. Okay, so do we have any final questions for Mike and his team before uh, we wrap up again? Um, this was a preliminary uh, receipt of the presentation for us to view it, ask questions of, of Mike um, to understand his thinking and, and hear based on his background. Uh, this is the very beginning of our thought process in terms of how we may proceed with the uh, snack bar facilities in town over the next year. So any uh, final questions before um, we finish up this part of the, the uh, agenda tonight? I just wanted to comment. Um, yes. Mike, I just I thought it would be important to let everybody know too that you've done work in town. You've done work at Weaver, correct? That's correct. Yep. New just Canaan. a comment. Um, we, we, yeah. And as well as Round Hill. Um, we've worked with them as well. Okay. So, um, yeah. We Pam, before understand. we close this. Okay. Go ahead. I say, Pam, before we close this out, maybe you could just touch a little bit more on, I know it's in your director's report, but specifically how many weekends have we had um, ad hoc vendors on site at the beaches this summer? Uh, who who has it been? Just a little bit of, um, if you could get a little color around that to the commission. Sure, I met with um, Brian from Rory's Restaurant and Russ from Jennifer's Kitchen. Um, I also met with a couple different vendors in town, but they, they just couldn't make it work. It was just too busy, too much stuff going on. But both of those vendors were willing to, to jump in and try to provide some food services at each beach. My original plan was to have both of them work together and have two others at Pear Tree. It didn't work out that way, so I split them. So Brian has been there, I believe, don't mark me to it, but I believe it was uh, July 17 because Mike, you were that was your first weekend there. Um, yep. Right, so Brian from Roy's set up on Saturday and Sundays, and then Jennifer's Kitchen couldn't get it together that weekend, but they went the following weekend and set up set up a pear tree Saturdays and Sundays. And then uh, Brian felt that it was advantageous to actually open up on Fridays as well, even though weather weather was typically pretty good, but there was some there was some um, challenging weather as well. So as of this last Sunday, it rained. And so, but his feedback was really good. He, he said the best day that he did was 1,200 in sales. It was definitely weather um, driven. Um, Russ is doing very well with his restaurant. He's very busy, but he, he liked the opportunity is fantastic at Pear Tree for him. So he is uh, having his wife and um, staff member setting up at Pear Tree. Again, like I said, outside of the concession with a grill, tables, chalkboards, uh, listing their prices. And they, they do use our refrigeration and our freezer inside to store things. And that was all vetted by um, Rob at Uncle's. He knew that we would be using his, the, the refrigerators and the freezers. So it's been, as far as I understand, very well taken. Um, people have been very happy with it. And um, it's been a good thing. I'm very pleased with it. And how long will that continue for? Just through Labor Day or? As, as far as I know, through Labor Day, that's what we've discussed. And now if they came back and said, would you mind if I stayed on another week? I, said, I don't see why not, if they were still interested in doing that. Um, I did say we're working on the honor system at the end of the season. I'd like to know what their sales are, and I'd like for them to give something back to the town. Okay. Okay, thanks for that, Pam. Um, any final questions from the commission? Okay, then. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, you've given, given us a lot of information, a lot to, um, to chew on, not to make a bad pun. And... Um, okay. You know, we'll be taking up the the topic at future commission meetings in terms of you know how we um how we think we may proceed going forward with our um with our uh, availability of our concessions as we uh, look to the 2021 season. Okay, so thank you for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Mike. We'll be in touch. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, um, 
Next item on the agenda is just the um, update and discussion on the beach capacity experiences to date. Um, as you all know, um, following our last meeting, uh, with anticipated very several very hot weekends, um, our surrounding communities uh, made decisions to close their beaches to non-residents, and that was done specifically under um, the emergency powers that were conveyed by Governor Lamont onto the first selectmen and mayors um, due to the COVID crisis. Um, so that was not an action that this commission could have taken, but Jamie was able to do so, you know, using her executive powers. Um, she did not make that decision lightly, I will tell you. We spent, um, you know, she consulted with myself and with, with Pam and the health director and others, and um, we were not the first to make the decision. We really were a follower with part of the decision based on the fact that as our surrounding communities, Norwalk and Stanford made the decision, the fear that that would drive more people than into our beaches, which are much smaller than those. So that decision was made. So based on that, we did restrict um, access to town residents, which also meant that um, on Saturdays and Sundays, walk-ins of the town would be ID'd as well to prove, to prove residency. So that was the background of the decision. Um, and Pam, you can just give us an update. We've been getting, again, we get the daily reports from our park monitors, which has been fantastic, car counts, et cetera, keeping an eye on what's been happening. Um, so we've been able to keep a very, very tight, tight eye on what's been happening. But Pam, you can add on. Sure, I just wanted to clarify from your statement that um, the executive order was to limit access to non-residents on the weekends only. Saturday and Sunday. So the beaches are, they give access to non-residents during the week, Monday through Friday. Um, they can buy a beach sticker. Um, it's just simply the Saturdays and Sundays that we're most concerned with, that were the most busiest. And um, we do not allow any walk-ins um, without ID. And if you don't have ID and you're from a different town, then you, you do get turned away. Um, it, 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 I was I was really concerned about it. I think like all of us, it's, you know, how we were going to manage that, but they did very well. Um, the guards did very well. We did as much um, advertising. We put the electric sign out there that would help people see it from Route 1 and Henley. Um, I think that helped the very, there was two weekends that we did that. And uh, we no longer are doing the electronic sign, but we do have visual signs at the gate. And um, there are very, it's it's pretty seldom at this point that we're getting people, um, especially at Pear Tree, there's not that many that are being turned away. Um, and the residents seem very happy about it. Um, yeah. And to clarify, the, the, um, the decision was made to allow for proper so, you know, social distancing, really, so that the beaches did not become crowded, so that people could not keep a comfortable space. It was not targeted, for instance, to keep people from, you know, New York out versus New Canaan versus anywhere else. It was very simply, simply a methodology to control crowds and therefore assure more spacing on, on the beach. So, and then Pam, you should mention that this past Sunday, based on the very poor weather, you did decide to send the staff home earlier um, and save the town quite a bit of money and with, with the weather and the wind and everything forecast, um, you know, there really was not a concern that there would be crowding, you know, crowding on the beach that afternoon and evening. Yeah, I'm very concerned about the amount of money that we have not budgeted for these particular patrol guards. And, and I'm very mindful of how much money we are spending and we're going to have to cover that somewhere. So on a particularly lousy day where people aren't going to the beach, um, you know, we, if there's going to be 10 cars there, we really shouldn't be concerned. We're not concerned with overcrowding. So I felt that uh, it was a good decision to save a little bit of you know, some bucks for the town. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly would do the same thing on another day that we felt was going to be a washout for the whole day. Pam, on your previous day at Weed, 
Um, what can you give me a ballpark number? How many people you have? No, we never went by um, the amount of people. We went by the actual um, parking spaces and we went by eyeballing the amount of space between each group. So our park monitors would walk up and down the beach every half hour and make sure that there was social distancing and there was enough room. And if there was not, then they would have that discussion about closing the beach to all foot traffic and parking. But we, we never got to that. We only got to one closing and that was July 5th for one hour. We did come close. Um, the park manager said, said they were concerned about parking at certain times, but the flow of people coming and going kept them from having to do that. Yeah, yeah the, the feeling was on some of those days that the extreme heat really did limit how long people stayed at the beach. That, that were, people weren't, you know, their observations were that people weren't coming and staying for eight and 10 hours. In many cases, they were coming for a few hours. And of course, what, what always impacts the, um, the attendance of the beaches are, are tides. We have about a six foot hot tide, and as you all know, as that water goes down, um, getting in for a swim becomes more challenging and less appealing, and then people get hot and they don't want to do it and go home. And then there was also, Pam, the issue with the, the sea lice. I don't know how much that kept people away or not. Our lifeguards would um, announce it daily um, when they first when the first case came out that we found out about it. Then they would continue to announce it. I did talk to one of the head lifeguards, our water coordinators. Um, at one point, uh, they hadn't heard of any other cases, nor had I, uh, nor had I heard from Jim about him hearing anything. So I don't know that they're still warning people because it's been quite a few weeks since we've heard it's, it's been a good, at least four weeks since we've heard of the case so they're simply just reminding people that it's a good practice to wash off you know after they come out of the water because we did have a case of the sea lice so washing it off from your body is a good thing that's it <laughs> Jim, I don't know if you want to comment on that. No, yeah, I think, they, I think they sort of stopped last weekend. It was there weren't a lot of cases anymore of it, and you know, once when they put signage up right when right when we started to have some cases of it, and we're making announcements and just kind of warning people to wash off. And um, after about a week and a half, they stopped really getting reports of it. So made an announcement for a few more days and I think that was about it. But it happens usually in August. I think we had a pretty hot July. I think that, that happened a little bit earlier than, than it normally does. So um, I think hopefully it'll be good for the rest of August. Okay, any other questions about uh, the be current beach protocols, experiences to date? I mean, we definitely are looking at uh, one, two, three more weekends of of the summer and then i would expect we would be talking to jamie about uh, how long we want to keep the weekend orders in in place oh i will mention Lori, that mm -hmm. just as of late um we have reduced the hours at pear tree um security gate to eight o'clock because we have uh, monitored the amount of uh, vehicles going in the park after eight is literally one to two. And it's, it, it's dark at eight o'clock. So it's not necessary for, we, the police department will continue to take, you know, drives through pair, but it's just not busy enough to warrant a guard there till 10 o'clock at night. Okay. okay. Any other questions on, on where we are? I mean, certainly as we uh, move into the fall and winter, uh, we'll be having more discussions about this, updating the rules, really, you know, thinking about how we want to tackle going forward, you know, thinking about things, whether we want to have a parking fee or an entrance fee. I expect we'd have to consult town council on that based on the information that he's provided so far and whatever, and, you know, how we want to go think, you know, how we want to go thinking about that and, you know, remaining within the, um, you know the laws that apply to uh, public access to beaches so we'll be having a lot more discussions about this um in the fall and over the winter 
Um, and certainly, you know, none of us know how long the current health crisis is going to last and how that's going to impact us for future for future seasons and what the extent of that will be. So this, this will be um, an ongoing topic, I am certain. Okay, so if there's no more questions on that, uh, Pam, you can give your director's report. Sure, um, I think the, the report speaks for itself, but I will um, highlight that um, the Cherry Lawn basketball invitation to bid did go out. Um, it's currently out now and the um, bid opening will be next Thursday at 3 p.m. So we shall see, I've, I've sent it out to a, do, a few separate individual vendors, two of which have already given us quotes from say the, the, the certain residents that were reaching out to individual vendors who also had sent me quotes. So I sent them an official invitation to bid as well as a few other random uh, vendors that I just researched in the area. Uh, so we'll see, you know, I uh, will see where, where it falls. And um, I did meet with our insurance company. Uh, they also give us a playground um, report um, on all the facilities that we have in terms of whether we have any, um, you know, um, hazards. But I did invite them out to, to report on the basketball court as well, just so that I would have that in writing from an insurance perspective. Um, you know, in terms of needing to make sure we were uh, at least 10 feet away from the dangerous roots that were coming up out of the ground and um, the actual uh, length and width of the court. So we'll see what happens next Thursday and whether or not we actually, they bid in terms of the amount of money we have. David Seely, who did make a presentation with the commission a few months back, I believe it was a few months back, um, he has been in touch. He understands the bid openings happening. He want, he still is uh, anxious to provide any donation if it doesn't come in. Um, if if it come, they, the bids come in too high, he's still willing to consider donating money to match that. So you know, I'll be in touch with him as well. Okay, so just about to highlight our brochure is coming out in September. Pam? Yes. Pam? Yeah, just a quick question. It's Mike uh, on that. Um, just procedurally, I mean, we have Dave, he's obviously put a tremendous amount of time into this kind of some sweat equity into it and he's contributing as well. So just what, what's your thoughts? I mean, I'd like to encourage you to kind of continue to work with Dave. I mean, I, I don't think you're suggesting you're only going to call him if you need money, if we need money from him, but he, you know, he has a vision, he's got a stake in it. So I guess, right. I mean, that's your sense, right. That you'll kind of keep him involved in the process and kind of make him a part of it right straight through. So so we don't get to a situation where at the end of this as much as he's kind of put into it um kind of like the private you know public partnership here that he doesn't come up feeling as though wait a minute you know he had a vision and there's a disconnect between his vision and the community's vision and what we've actually delivered if you follow my point right sure he's been in touch with me and i um he asked a few questions i actually i sent him out the invitation to bid so he could see the scope of work um and um he did you know he said to please just keep them informed and I certainly will. Okay. But there's not much more we can do once the vendors submit, right? They're gonna submit, say they submit 15, 20, 25, 30, 30,000 for the job, right? Say well, they all collect $30,000. The I'm, best thing I'm I can sorry, do sorry. is work with David and say, no, okay, we're gonna... Let me, just ask a more specific, um, let me just ask a more specific question. And so I have the RFP in front of me, I'm going through it. And kind of, it looks like the main thrust of what we've asked for in the scope of services is to basically patch the blacktop. And, um, you know, we have an ad alternate which says replace the blacktop. But, you know, my recollection of the conversation, you know, that we all had when Dave joined us was not about patching the blacktop, it was about replacing the blacktop. So, you know, certainly in kind of the, and certainly in the RFP, there's a possibility of a disconnect between what we discussed as a commission and what we led Dave to believe we were moving forward with and what's in the RFP. And I think that's a little bit of an, you know, I, I just would, I, I, I'd be uncomfortable if that turned into an issue. Uh, the issue being, as I said, you know, we as a commission, I think left the table and left the discussion with the thought that we were going out in particular with, you know, contributions from Dave and his help to continue to, you know, add into the mix if it was necessary. 
to put new blacktop down. And this specifically talks about filling and patching cracks, divots, unless I'm misunderstanding what this is saying here. So that's, I, when I saw this, it looked to me like that was a little different than I recalled of the conversation. And I'll, I'm willing to stand corrected, but my understanding coming away from that conversation was new blacktop, not patching the existing blacktop. The, and the quotes that Dave Seeley had one of which was um, given to me separately and also given to me by him, um, who has also been asked to bid on this um, job, was a $15,000 job. And that was, I went through that bid and that bid was not redoing. To redo that whole court is gonna cost way more than $20,000. So we had to go at it as a, you know, re, like resurfacing. That's what the original quotes were, resurfacing. And then we put an ad alternate that would extend out to make 80 feet. We took away 10 feet for the safety aspect of putting the pole away from the roots and not affecting the tree roots. No cutting of the tree roots. So we would pull the poles up. And then if we did not alternate, add alternate, it would have to extend the court into the far field that would actually have to put blue new black top on the resurfacing, extending the resurfacing. So that's exactly how that bed when I met with Ed, I met I went over the old quotes that came in from him. And that's it was all resurfacing. It was never brand new. If it was brand new, you'd never get a court for fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, I may be just reading too much into what's here then, uh, kind of getting hung up on the term patch and cracks. So um, look, I'll my, leave it to you. I'll leave it to, I'll leave it to yeah. Dave. My, my only guidance, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into the kind of the operations of this. My only guidance is that, you know, we had, you know, we had members of the community kind of passionate about this. And mm -hmm. I, my only guidance is let's kind of, I'm hoping by the time we get to the end of this, that we don't have a disconnect between what they thought we were signing up for you know, as a commission and as a town and what they ended up with. Or to, I, I hope there's a kind of, a, you know, an alignment between those two things and it's not a disconnect, that's, that's all. Sure, I, I get it. I know what we were working, we were working with $15,000 and we were working with an additional 5,000 from Dave. So very conscious think, of that. Yeah. Well, and I believe, we'll as you said, I believe Dave, I believe, I'm sorry to cut you off. I believe Dave also indicated he'd be willing to raise additional money mm -hmm. if that was necessary as well, right? And I'm, I'm guessing, those kind of offers were to achieve a specific outcome. So once again, I'm not trying to get in the middle of it. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just reflecting based upon what I heard in a prior when we had the prior conversation. And my only guidance back here is to let's just make sure we don't like. Once again, we're in alignment with the members of the community, who you know have really put a lot into this, including not only sweat equity but you know contributing dollars into this as well. Sure. No, I'll be. I'll stay right on top of it. We'll, I'll discuss it with him. I'm not going to cut anybody off without just, you know, getting in touch with Dave too and seeing what else he wants to do if they are too high. Um, and maybe there'll some that will come in low. So, you know, we'll we'll see what happens on Thursday. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I think Patty Baumgartner in the past has also mentioned that she felt she could assist with um, some additional fundraising. So, I think Mike's point is well taken. Is we're not completely working to just the budget of dollars because you know there has been information from the community mm -hmm. saying you know we're willing to step up and help pay for this and, and get the court that we've been desiring so right okay. so that's it for my report jim i don't know if you want to add anything yeah i um it's it's been one of the things i know noted in the report was that it's our summer registration i took a look at it uh last couple of days and it's up 40 percent over what it was last year so we have a lot of people that are um unfortunately or fortunately having to stay home um and participating in programs uh, whether it's you know soccer tennis uh jamie added a ninja camp this week up at cherry Lawn. it's been very well received so um we've been busy we've been having a lot of programs on a lot of camps this summer um, and I think overall they've been going pretty successfully. So that's that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Any other questions for Pam? Okay, good. Thanks, Pam. Um, not too much for me to report beyond uh, what we've talked about. Big focus over the last month has really been on you know the beaches, the beach capacity, and and managing 
you know, through that working, as I said, with our other elected officials and town and town staff. I did want to raise that, believe it or not, it'll be coming up on a year before too long since the the parks visit we had last October. Uh, we had, you know, hoped to do one in the spring, but current circumstances really prohibited us from doing that. But, you know, I would like to put out there that assuming, you know, the uh, current, you know, rules for gathering and such and being, especially in outdoors environments, hold uh, that we think about having another parks visit maybe around the same time frame. And I just want to throw that out if the late October seemed to work well with people. I know even in September, people are still doing summer activities and such. But um, think about getting that on the calendar if, if people um, are amenable. But I know I really, really enjoyed the day. Uh, got a lot out of it. It was great to be together in um, a little bit less structured environment than our meetings. It would certainly be wonderful to all physically be together again in, you know, an outdoor environment where we can uh, stand six feet apart and we might not have to carpool. We might not be able to carpool like we did. We don't have to go in our individual cars. But you know, just want to get a sense of whether people. Um, you know, concur that that was a good exercise and that we should try to schedule that again for um, later this fall. So I'm seeing Agreed. some, I'm, I'm seeing nods. Okay, I guess from Mike. Uh, Kathy, you weren't with us last year, but we visited uh, five parks, I think. Was it four or five parks? We weren't able to get to all of them. So uh, probably we'd want to think about getting to some of the, uh, the ones we haven't been to in the past. And then Jim Flynn, our Parks Operation Manager was with us to talk about, um, you know, different unique aspects to managing and maintaining each of the, each of the parks. So, um, okay, well, Pam and I will talk about getting some dates out there for people to calendar. Um, you know, if you have a particular park, you're like, I really, really either want to get back to a certain park or if, you know, you know, ones that you really want to make sure we get on the list that we missed last time or whatever, please, you know, certainly shoot us a note. Other than that, we'll try to put together an agenda getting some of the different parks and also coming up, you know, we kind of tried to loop it so traffic wise, we kind of made a circle around town. So um, I think that will be really, you know, really good to um, do and, and get out and get out there as well. So uh, that's really all I had for this evening. Okay, does anybody have any other uh, new business that they'd like to, uh, to propose that we discuss? No. Okay, then hearing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I moved. Okay, um, I think I heard Mike first, so we'll take Mary Louise as the second. Um, and Pam, you have to uh, roll call us out. Okay, Lori? Yep. Sarah? Yes. Susan? Yes. Mary Louise? Oh, she, she motioned yes. it. Lucy? Yep. Kathy? Yes. And Tier. Tier's gone. <laughs> yes, we lost Tier. And you did Susan? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Susan? Susan? She's on mute. Yes, she did. She yes. said yes. Okay. 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 I thought Sorry. I got her. Good night, okay. all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.